this uh, discussion, I may talk about the enemy, the devil, but uh, but we are not going to do a whole study about him. But in our discussions, we may talk about some other things he does. As I always say, we don't need to know a lot about the devil, but God in his wisdom has decided to give us sufficient information about him in the Bible so that we know how he functions. And then once we know how he functions, we can be fully equipped to face or to deal with his strategies and remain victorious. And what I want to discuss with you today is how we can, what, uh, well, first of all, I want to tell you some of the strategies the devil, the enemy uses against God's people. And in that context, I will be talking to you about how we can protect our minds. And I think you all will be interested about this subject. How to protect your mind from the attacks of the enemy. And I would like to start off by talking about culture. I'm, I'm sure all of you listening to this talk right now and also in the future are familiar with the word culture. And I believe you all have your own understanding or definition of culture. I have a habit of studying different things from different perspectives. And then also, I usually check a dictionary to know what a certain word or expression is defined in the dictionary. So as you, as I always do, I checked in the dictionary, the English dictionary for culture, and the dictionary meaning is a culture refers to the customs and beliefs or the art or the way of life and social organization of a particular country or group. And this is what a dictionary says, or this is what most of the dictionaries say. So it's, in their opinion, it is the customs, beliefs, art, way of life, and social organization of a particular country or group. My definition of, cu of culture based on my understanding of the Word of God is slightly different. I would like to say culture is the core belief of a group of people or the core belief of a country or a tribe. I would like to say it this way. Culture is not just how people of a country or people of a region or a people of a tribe dress, eat, and it is not about their social practices. It is much bigger than that. And my personal definition is that culture is the external expression of their core belief. So whether it is their dress or the way they eat food or whether it is the social practices or the customs, it's all the expression of what they really believe in their heart, whether it is about God, themselves, or others. So in a single sentence, we can say a culture is the external expression of the core belief of a group of people. And I think when you look at culture from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense to you. So what we refer to as culture or what people of often refer to as culture is actually what people really believe in their heart. And therefore, we must pay attention to what we believe in our hearts. And we, sh we cannot just say, well, uh, especially when we talk about the Word of God and how Word of God, um, how we should be actually always practicing the Word of God, we often refers 
refer to culture. And we take certain practices as acceptable because it is a part of the culture. And then, and in essence, what we are trying to say is that our culture supersedes the word of God. And I'm sure you, you have come across situations uh, several times in your lives where you are told that you should do certain things or practice certain things because that is a part of your culture, even though it contradicts the word of God. And I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about people who are born again. I'm talking about people who say they are Christians. Does that make sense to you? I would like to I would like for you to look at Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23. And most of you are familiar with this scripture. It says in one of the versions, English versions, it's it says that be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now the most common version is that uh Take care of your hearts diligently because, uh, because the issues of life springs or spring from it. Or guard your heart with all diligence because out of it are the issues of life. But what that means is be careful how you think because your thoughts really shape your life. And therefore, I must submit to you that we should be careful about what we think in our hearts, or we should be careful about the thoughts we carry in our hearts. And you will be surprised to know that some of the thoughts we think are not our own thoughts. Some of the thoughts we carry in our hearts and some of the thoughts we think, they are not our own. And they don't belong to God either. They don't come from God either. So if, if some of the thoughts you carry in your hearts do not come from God, then where do they come from? from? They do come from the enemy. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that Satan, according to the Bible, is after your life. He's after my life. And one of the most successful strategies and one of the most uh, ignored strategies, ignored in the sense that we ignore it or we are not aware of it, those strategies, one of the most successful strategies the enemy uses against the believer is by implanting his ideas in our minds. In other words, he hits every believer with his ideas, with his thoughts, because he's targeting believers all the time. And where does he hit you with his ideas? Of course, he hits your mind. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying he can you know, control your mind. I'm not saying he can simply planned a thought in your mind, but he can speak to you. And unfortunately, whenever the enemy speaks, we pay attention. And what he tells us most of the times, go deep into our hearts. And that's why, and again, why I am, saying this in at the introduction is we think thoughts and we usually think that the th the thoughts we think are our own thoughts but most of the time we are simply allowing certain thoughts to pass through our minds because we are hearing those thoughts without even knowing that we are hearing them and then 
when, I, when we pay attention to a thought and when they go deep down in your hearts, it, those thoughts settle there. And that's why we learn from Proverbs again, 23, chapter 23, verse 7, we learn that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So whatever you think in your heart, you become. Even though you can pretend to be somebody different, you are actually what you think about yourself or what you think about God or what you think about others in your heart. So as I said earlier, whatever you think in your heart is going to shape your life. For this reason, Holy Spirit wants us to be careful about what we think or he wants us to be careful about the thoughts we carry or holy spirit wants us to be careful about the thoughts that rise in our minds so here is something i want you to pay attention to we often talk about God speaking to his children, Holy Spirit speaking to his children. That is a wonderful thing. But what I want to tell you tonight is that Satan is always speaking to people, not only the non-believers, but also to believers. And he will speak words that sound good. And if you're writing notes, you can write this. Satan will always speak words that sound good and words or sentences with emotional lining emotional linings around it and he will all and he will speak words that sound spiritual and once we begin to pay attention to what the enemy tells us those words will begin to affect our mindset about everything and gradually we may even change our mindset about everything and i have i read some teachers and in and some teachers or and scholars uh, they have named satan as the invisible intruder in our lives uh, now, and I, I like that term because it, it, has, it has a good meaning behind it. Because Satan or our enemy or the enemy of our soul comes to our life or comes to us uninvited. And he comes with the disruptive intentions. So he can be appropriately called an invisible intruder. Now, I said all these things just as an introduction about the enemy that we are talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, here is a, a statement that I want you to pay attention to. Everything that looks good or sounds good is not always good. What is good in our own eyes may not be good in God's eyes. So the question is, how can you know and decide whether something is good or bad or evil? Now here is a statement from, I once heard John Bevere teaching and and what I'm going to say right now is not an exact quote, but it's a paraphrase. And he said something like this, and I thought that it was a very uh, profound statement. He said, if you could know what is good with your natural ability, there could have been no need for the gift of discerning of spirits. And when he said that, or when I, I think, I don't know if I heard him say that or read somewhere, either of that. When he said that, at least two 
different questions popped up in my mind. And the first one was, what is the need of God giving us the Bible if every believer is already wise? That means if every believer can know naturally what is good and what is evil, there, there was no need for God to give us the Bible. And then why God chose to give us the Bible and Holy Spirit if we could know what is good without these two. These two means without the Bible and without Holy Spirit. And these are, I know these are, are statements that may provoke you to think more deeply about it and, and even uh, may cause you to wonder you know, okay, am I, am I really wise then? Am I, well, the answer is we need to be connected to God to, be, to remain wise, especially in the things of God and when dealing with the enemy. Uh, let me give you an incident from the Bible, from the Old Testament. When Satan tempted Eve, she was in a perfect environment. I think you would agree with me on that. She was not living in a fallen world. If we want to use today's terminology, we can say she was in the perfect church where the word of God was presented accurately and perfectly yet satan was able to defeat her by questioning the word of god the conversation between satan and the, and eve about the fruit and and then the actual eating of the fruit might not be a one day incident when you read the Bible, it may look like that, you know, the enemy just popped up from somewhere and started talking to her, and then she immediately ate the fruit. It might not have happened in that fashion. I think the serpent talked to Eve several times and for a longer duration before she actually uh, ate the fruit. And now this is uh, what I think. I could be wrong, but this is what I think. I don't think she, he, he, he came up, he came in front of her and talked to her and everything happened in uh, five minutes. I think he has been, or he had been at that time talking to her for some time. And then finally, after she was so convinced, she ate the fruit. The Bible clearly states that Eve ate the fruit because she saw it was good. In other words, she ate the fruit after she realized it was good. How did she know that it was a good fruit? Isn't that a good question? How did she know before eating it? So I believe the enemy convinced her it was a good fruit. And believe it or not, the fruit was a good fruit. It was not an evil fruit. In other words, Eve did not eat an evil fruit. She ate a good fruit. How do I know this? Because Genesis chapter 2 verse 9 tells us that all the trees that grew up in the garden of Eden were beautiful and they produced delicious fruits. If I want to stretch a little further, I would say God did not plant an evil tree in the garden of Eden. 
there was no tree bearing an evil fruit in the Garden of Eden. All the trees were good, and they all produced good fruits, and they were all delicious fruits. We know from the Bible that in the middle of the garden, God placed the tree of life and also the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as I said, it was a good fruit and she was convinced by the enemy of her soul that it was a good fruit. And we know that the knowledge about good and evil is a good thing. It's not an evil thing. And she ate the fruit of that tree. I want you to remember this. Eve ate a good fruit. Yet, the result of eating that good fruit was evil. Now, you know, spiritual discernment is knowing what is good and what is evil. Right? Discernment means to separate good from evil. Or simply speaking, to know what is good and what is evil. That is discern. That is spiritual discernment. But we should not forget one thing. Spiritual discernment is not just knowing what is good and what is evil. It is actually knowing what is good and what is evil from God's perspective. In the Garden of Eden, God was the source of discernment for them. You remember that? When Eve was tempted, Satan told her three things. This is in Genesis chapter 3. He said, your eyes will be open if you eat this fruit. Your eyes will be open, meaning you will have greater awareness. And then he said, you will be like God. And you will know the difference between good and evil. And I want you to pay attention to this. They were, both Adam and Eve, were already like God because they were created in God's image. But Satan convinced them or convinced Eve and then Adam that if they ate the fruit, they would be like God. But they were already like God. And then, or before he made that statement, he told them that your eyes will be open, meaning you will have greater awareness, and then you will also know the difference between good and evil. And by doing that, Satan told them that they would get a permanent and a resident source of discernment that they no longer had to depend on God. Remember I told you that in the Garden of Eden, God was a source of discernment, of differentiating good from evil. And by his trickery, he told even Adam that if they ate the fruit, they will be like God, they will have better awareness, spiritual awareness, and they will know the difference between good and evil and and they would no longer have to depend on god to know what is good and what is evil they would have something in them permanently you, do you are you following what i'm saying this is how the enemy works he speaks to us directly or through people and we usually think about the things we hear 
or I should say the thoughts that come through come to us from the enemy through different media and the more we think about it the more we are convinced because those thoughts go deep down in our hearts and then they begin to shape our lives we begin to change according to the thoughts we allow in our hearts and that's the reason the bible says in galatia sorry in colossians chapter 3 i think it's the 17th verse where it says that let the word of god dwell in you richly in abundance we should have an abundance of the scriptures an abundance of the word of god residing in our hearts so that our lives are shaped by the word of god in other words our lives are shaped by the thoughts of god in other words we begin to think like god we begin to think the thoughts that god wants us to think so that we don't agree with the world system so that we don't allow the thoughts of the enemy that operates through the world system to reside in our hearts and then shape our lives if you and i allow the word of god to dwell in our hearts means to dwell means to where you allow the word of god to make its home in your hearts then the word of god the living word of god or the thoughts of god are going to shape your lives they are going to shape my life and then we are going to remain connected to god on a regular basis on a daily basis and we are not going to let the enemy control our lives in other words, we will not buy his lies. We will not agree with his lies. That come to us through the system or the culture around us. And that's the reason I, I uh, started off with culture. And I think I have given you some food for thought. Maybe I can give you uh one more example I give you one from the new old testament let me give you one from the new testament remember peter peter in in the gospel of matthew chapter 16 peter had a great revelation about who jesus christ was and when the Lord asked him, asked his disciples, not just Peter, what they thought about him, Peter was the only one who had the revelation about who Jesus was. And he spoke and said, you are the son of God. You are the Christ, the Messiah. And the Lord said, you didn't come up with that. You know, it, it wasn't your own intelligence or wisdom that uh, produced that kind of statement but the father had revealed it to you that means peter had a revelation from heaven about who jesus was that's a great thing that's an admirable thing but then later when the lord said he would be crucified or when the when the lord said he would die or the jews would kill him in jerusalem peter tried to dissuade the lord and this is recorded in chapter 16 of Matthew, and you can read from verses 21 to 23. And if you read that passage, you would agree with me that when Peter told the Lord Jesus he should not go to the cross, it sounded good. Peter was speaking to the Lord like a true friend. He took the Lord aside and spoke to him privately. And everything he said sounded good. You can see the emotions of a true 
friend in Peter or in the words of Peter, you can see his emotions. And Peter sounded spiritual because whatever Peter said was an, an expression of his love for the Lord. So it sounded spiritual. It sounded true. But how did the Lord respond to it? When Peter said, oh, no, 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 you should not go to the cross. You should not die. How did the Lord respond? He said, get behind me, Satan. Although the, the suggestion from Peter sounded good, it wasn't good. Now remember, Peter was behaving like a true friend. He was a true friend to the Lord in that sense. And, and he was always the first one who showed loyalty to the Lord. Because if you look at Peter and his life or his time with the Lord, you will see that he always said something that would exhibit his faith in Jesus the Lord. And when you read the gospel records, you would, you would notice that Peter's actions seemed more spiritual than others' actions. Yet the Lord discerned that what Peter said was not from the Heavenly Father. So what do we learn here? We need to discern things accurately. We need to know the source of every thought that comes to us. And when I say every thought that comes to us, I'm not only referring to the thoughts that rise up in your minds, but the thoughts that are brought to you through different media. The things you read, the things you watch in television, the things you hear from people. They, are, they all are thoughts brought to you or presented to you. And you need to discern. You need to discern what is coming from God and what is not coming from God. You need to discern whether those thoughts that come to you are good or evil. You need to ascertain the source. And as I said earlier, God has given us two things, the Word of God and Holy Spirit. And we must fill our minds with the Word of God and listen to Holy Spirit. And when we come back again next week, we will talk a little bit more about it. But I want you to, if you have taken notes, go through everything you have written down. And if you have questions, when we come back next Thursday, we can talk, uh, we can take, uh, talk about the questions first or discuss the questions first and uh, learn a little bit more. And uh, throughout this week, I want you to be aware of these things, that everything that comes, from, comes to us is not from God. And we need to discern it. And we have the Word of God and Holy Spirit to help us. And if we pay attention to it, we would be able to know the source of the things that come to us and what action we need to take to discern things better is to read the word and fill our minds with the word of God. And I would like to leave you with this thought. Fill your minds with the word of God. Let the word of God reside in your hearts in abundance. Let there be, let there be an abundance of the thoughts of God in your hearts so that they do really shape your life. Thank you. Thank you for coming to this meeting and uh, allowing me to speak to you.